I have a little question. If that's all right. Um, I really liked uh, I really liked your speech. I really liked your presentation. Uh, as we went through, I, I immediately made a connection with the United Kingdom, of course, as you did yourself. And I wondered a little bit. Of course, the context of a populist government, and I wouldn't call the Tory government quite a populist government yet. But maybe it starts to go that way a little bit. But I was wondering uh, what you might think. Uh, Italy might learn from what may be coming now with this Brexit referendum or the Brexit implementation and the leaving of the European Union because, um, you know, if they, it's very much about taking back the power. Right? The narrative in the UK, they've said it themselves. I think in the letter May sent to Donald Tusk, she said it was about restoring the right of the British to, to take decisions, to take power back from Brussels. It's very much Margaret Thatcher said the same thing. So I think it's very consistent with what you say about taking back the power. You delegate authority to international institutions to regulate uh, and take decisions and implement your decisions in a sense. And now they're taking it back. Uh, but what happens when the British government now has to take responsibility for migration or financial discipline or for the single market? Uh, how will it cope? Because how would the five star movement cope if it actually now becomes liable? Uh, for uh, decisions, you know, uh, regulating exactly these things that are being delegated to the European Union, or constrained anyway by Europe or by, by other agreements. So, uh, no, no, I mean, I think, I think you're perfectly right, of course. I mean, the, the problem with all these uh, and, uh, is that this is a, a, a major, I mean, what, what Dostoevsky says, you know, you may not like the wall, but the wall is there. And if you if you go against it with your head, you're going to you know <laughs> to uh, to harm yourself seriously. So I think that uh, we are coming to the moment when uh, we are going to see the effects of all this, and uh, uh, one can really wonder what the effects of all this uh, might be. So when reality gets back, and uh, these people will discover that. Uh, the effects of all these are damaging, or we'll start seeing that there is an actual, they've gone against their interest. Uh, what is going to happen? Because one of the, uh, I don't know about Britain, but certainly one of the things that uh, are clear in Italy is that this anger is so strong that it is ready, it's able to overcome uh, partial failures. Uh, Five Star is govern has been governing in Italy for a few months, so you know it's very early to speak about failure. But they've been governing my city, Rome, uh, for a couple of years now, and it's been an absolute disaster. Uh, the previous administrators were quite bad, but uh, but this is even worse. Uh, surprisingly enough, because you know even worse is. Uh, but uh, there is a, a very strong resistance to any reality check. So always the thing is, yes, but you know, they need time and the others have done so badly. So there is a very strong positive prejudice that is able to overcome reality. Then of course one can argue there are the eco chambers on the social media. They are telling each other always the same, the same story. So there is also that. But there is also a very strong desire to say, we want to go down this road. Because so either there is a major, a major check, a major disaster, or I don't see this thing stopping. Uh, in a way, this is what it seems that Europe wants to create in these very days. I mean, the, Europe has gone, is attacking Europe. I mean, Brussels and the, the European system is now attacking Italy very, very hardly on the budget. And the idea is we want to show you immediately what is the price of what you're doing. This is quite clear. And it's a political, of course, it's a political tactic uh, in thinking about the elections. But either something really tough comes. But if something really tough comes, uh, I don't see, and that's my major, because, you know, this is what the the enemies of these populist governments wish for. You know, what we say in Italy, forza spread. You know, the spread comes. And, you know, major crisis of the sovereign debt and the bloody populists founder and go away. And they think 
we are back, the responsible ones. I don't think that is going to happen. I think that if the catastrophe comes, uh, what the Italians will see is that they were actually right. They don't have sovereignty any longer, any longer. So they are not going to vote for those that accept the loss of sovereignty. They are going either not to vote at all and say, well, why should we bother? It doesn't matter. So, uh, or they're going to vote for someone which is even nastier than the populists. But either way, I think we are facing a, a real crisis of democracy. So if the catastrophe comes, the lesson will be, yes, you voters don't matter any longer. And this is not a lesson that the Italians are going to take lightheartedly, I think. So but I'm very pessimistic. So. Maybe I'm wrong. Yes, I don't know what's. Uh, I want to ask you: Have you seen any, or do you consider that the traditional parties have understood the message so far, and they are doing something that really responds to other than populism themselves? That they are like thinking what to do and how to tackle the, the challenge they have in front. For the European elections, we talked before, and, and it doesn't seem like that. Considering the candidates yet considered to choose, uh, but I mean, anyone in Europe <laughs> that you might consider could be going in a, you know, trying to make sense of it from the, oh, the uh, traditional parties. From the Italian Observatory, the short answer is they are pathetic, literally, and they don't understand. Uh, they they don't know really. They don't know what to do, but in a way. A great part of it is their fault. Another part of it is that it is really difficult to cope with the populists. Because if you don't get down to, to their method, then uh, no one is going to listen to you any longer. So it's about slogans. So if you go for slogans, then people are going to say, look, they are just the same. So. Why should we not vote for the populists? Is the, op the opponents of the populists are populists? I mean, Renzi. In Italy, Renzi was the typical example. Renzi was a populist. I mean, his methodology was populist, and a lot that he did was populism. So basically, after a while, people just said, well, look, so, and he legitimized the populists. On the other hand, if you don't play the populist, then people are not going to listen to you because what you're saying is too long, too boring, too complicated, and people are not going to listen to you. So they are in a trap. The populists should have stopped, should have been stopped before. Now it's too late. And uh, you can, I think you can get out of the trap only, only to the other side. You cannot get back. Only going so far away on that road that you, you need to get back because it so clearly doesn't work any longer that you need to get back. And so they, and, uh, they think that this is just communication. Uh, they are trapped into, above all, the Partito Democratico, which is the most important opponent. It's trapped into political correctness, doesn't, is unable to get out of it. It's uh, divided, fragmented. There's a part of it who would like to to uh, co cooperate with the Five Star Movement, which, by the way, I think could have been a good idea from the beginning. Uh, another, so they are divided strategically. Then the various potential leaders are battling against each other. Renz is still there blocking everything, but Renzi has lost all credibility, so is a major problem. So in Italy, there is no answer. There is no answer to that. Answers can be provided in countries that are less advanced on this road. I mean, Germany, certainly, or I'm not so sure France, because France is very advanced on that road. It seems spent to me by now. To me, it seems spent. Uh, in France, certainly. In Europe, I don't know, but uh, Macron had a very ambitious European agenda. He has done nothing. He couldn't do anything because the Germans have said no to 80% and the Northern European countries have said no to the other 20%. So 
we must face the fact that the pro-European forces are going to go to the European elections with nothing in their hands except anti-populism. This is their only instrument. And uh, being anti-something is very dangerous because you are giving centrality to your enemies. This is what the left has been doing in Italy for 20 years against Berlusconi. Net result, he won three elections. Because, of course, they were giving him centrality in the public space. He was the agenda setter. So I am worried about the fact that mainstream parties have nothing to offer on a European, on a European level. And uh, if the, uh, the populists say, you know, uh, we are aware that we are proposing a leap in the dark, but the alternative is to stay where you are now, are you happy to be where you are now? It's, it's, I, it seems to me like the elections, the presidential elections. I mean, it was, you know, the establishment and the crazy guys and nothing in between. This is a very, I think it's a very dangerous, uh, very dangerous situation because people, many unhappy people, ang angry people will say, let's try the, the crazy ones. Above all, if it is for the European Parliament that people think doesn't matter. They are wrong, but this is what their voters think. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Giovanni. It was an extremely enlightening uh, talk. And I hope you don't mind my saying this. I hope you don't find me too egocentric. But I, I think it gave empirical support to what I was trying to say this morning. And one of the points that to me seems central, and you focused that, uh, is this conflict um, between populism and the idea of constitutionalism. Uh, so I'm not sure that we could say that populism is there against democracy as such. I rather, I prefer to think that they are, are a variant of uh, the democratic disposition, but they are against the idea of constitutionalism. And one of the central ideas of constitutionalism, of course, is the idea of checks and balances and the idea of separation of powers. So uh, I have a point. Let me just spend an extra minute on this. So one could argue that when you were saying that the government is ever less uh, responsible for a widening uh, field of political decision because it delegates to other actors. So we can make the argument that the evolution of the modern state in that direction is itself a product of the separation of powers, of the spirit of separation of powers. So you have the growth of the administrative state first, and then of the regulatory state afterwards, as an expression of the separation of powers. So the other two powers, well, the other three powers, in fact, uh, give up on their political possibilities, both the judicial and the executive and the legislative, and they start to create these new agents, independent agents, that make their own decisions in the economy, in the protection of the consumer, in the environment, whatever. Now, you then mention this wonderful quote by Mario Monti, this infamous uh, quote, that Italians should be more like Germans. In one sense, maybe unconsciously, Monti was saying a very deep thing. Now, we tend to say, and I come from Portugal, we had this debate all over in the last 80 years regarding the comparison between us and the Germans. And if someone said something like that, we would say, well, the Germans are supposedly the hard-working ones, and we in the South are lazy, something like that on, that, on, on those lines. But maybe Monty, I'm trying to save Monty's face here, maybe Monty was saying something else, uh, that the true foremost interpreters of constitutionalism after the Second World War, ironically, were the Germans and the school of ordo liberalism. And it was so important to found the uh, institutions in Europe, especially something you mentioned that is the object of anger in Italy, in Portugal, in Spain, in Greece, and in France, which are the system of rules, that you have blind rules that uh, that, that bind every other state, member state. It's almost like a, an anti-mechanism you have to obey. 
So that's the whole idea of order liberalism, right? But then, you know, to create this economic constitution in which you, you people the public sphere with independent organs and agents and rules like constitutional rules, and then you have to obey them regardless of their being more or less democratic. But what is the purpose of ordo liberalism and the Germans after the Second World War? It was not, like you said, to deepen democracy. That was not their purpose. But it was to deepen something that the populists value and we value. That's why we, I think we are here in a standing, which is freedom, personal freedom. So personal freedom can be better protected by constitutionalism as against pure democracy. And of course, economic prosperity. You know, the order liberals are making the case that that way you'll be wealthier, right? You fight poverty and so on and so forth. You'll have a better welfare state to take care of you and your kids. But the populists also want that, right? They don't have an alternative program. That's why someone uh, at lunchtime was, um, I think it was you, Giovanni, actually. I don't know. Uh, something, someone was making fun of it. Well, not making fun, but was criticizing the whole idea of the end of history by Fukuyama. But in this specific aspect, maybe he's right. Maybe we, on the one hand, and the populace on the other, are much more similar than we like to think. Because both of us, both us and the populace, want the same thing. Right? We want freedom, personal freedom, more or less, I would say, Podemos or Jigesha or, you know, Salvini. They want personal freedom, um, people to do their own choices, and they all want uh, their countries to grow faster, economically speaking. But that's what we want too, right? Isn't that the end of, of history after all? I, w I wasn't making fun of Fukuyama. No, I, I was just saying that you were mentioning this fact that there are ideas that seem very fashionable in a moment, and then maybe a, a few years after, they just everyone is criticizing. And I think that Fukuyama had a point there, and it's the book is much more brilliant than the way it is portrayed normally. You know, so I, I totally agree with that. Um, no, I mean, it's, if if you take so general aims, uh, you know, it's very difficult to to disagree on that. So, uh, if you want uh, people to be able, you know, to so self determination, personal 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 freedom, and and prosperity, it's difficult to set any other. It's they are so high level aims that if we take that kind of point of view history is indeed finished. I mean, we all agree about the fact that we want that. Uh, of course, of course they want that, but there is something, uh, if we get, l let's say, a bit lower, we, we get to the second level. And the second level is that there is an issue of collective self-determination that they are, they are raising. And I think this is the, this is the issue. I'm very, I mean, I, I'm very much following the, the lesson of Marcel Gaucher here. I mean, clearly there is a tension in democracy. We were you were mentioning this this morning. Guillermo was mentioning this this morning. Clearly, democracy is a field of tensions. There's, there's, that is not a system, is not coherent, is not consistent. And if you want to uh, express democracy in all its aspects, you break it down because its aspects go in, in, in divergent directions. So it's a very contradictory uh, thing, a very contradictory machinery. And one of the greatest contradictions is that it's, it's promising at the same time individual self-determination and collective self-determination. And you, can, you cannot have one without the other. You, an Italian cannot be individually self-determined if Italy as a country is not collectively self-determined because you are too weak alone as an individual to withstand the forces of history. So you must be protected by a community. It cannot be Italy, can be Rome, can be Lazio, can be Europe, but you must be protected by a community. So your individual self-determination depends on the self-determination of your collectivity. But the more your collectivity is asking of you things, the less you are self-determined. So there is a, a very strong let's say, contradiction there. 
And of course, constitutionalism is one way to solve this kind of balance. What the populists are declaring, and also, and that I agree with you when this morning you were saying, they ask the correct questions, even though they don't give the correct answers. One of the questions they're putting on the table is, we have gone too far on the side of the limitations of popular sovereignty. So if this is a balanced machinery, now it has become an unbalanced machinery because the rule of law, constitutionalism, the judicial boundaries have become too strong vis-a-vis -vis the power of representative institutions that express popular sovereignty. This is what they're saying. It is, I think it is not so easy to say that they are wrong because as a matter of fact, they are right. Now, one can argue voters are so stupid that the more they're limited, the better. I, I can buy that argument. The problem is ask them and convince them of this. So there is, I think, a problem there. Of, and they would argue you cannot get prosperity and individual freedom if your national community is not able take decisions, effective decisions. This cannot be done because, why? Because of course you as an individual depend on the power of your community and because prosperity is something that the self-regulating global market is not able to deliver. Of course this is connected to the Great Depression. So there is that element as well. So that would say, of, of course the aims are the same, we think that we need a different balance inside the democratic machinery. I, I tend to agree with them, even though the problem is now, once you have created all those limits, undoing them is very complicated, very dangerous, potentially very damaging. Once you are in the Euro, getting out of it can be an absolute disaster. So. I can, even, I can even agree in principle we should not have entered into the euro. I'm, I'm even ready to say that. The problem is once you are in, yeah. how do you get that without destroying Italy? Yeah. That's the major, and that's where I say their answer is wrong. But the problem is, is there. 